Welcome to My Life. We're in part two talking to Colette Tauby Dewasik, who is the author of a book called The Sixth of Twelve. Uh, as you might be able to imagine, Colette comes from a family of 12, <laughs> and she was number six. The story is really a fascinating one. Uh, Colette grew up in the east side of Detroit. She's lived in the metropolitan area all of her life. She's not only the author of this, but she's written a, a couple of other books as well, which we'll talk about later. But uh, when we left off last time, we were talking about Colette's experience in, in, in high school uh, on the east side of Detroit. And what high school did you go to again, Colette? Dominican High School. And did the Dominican Sisters of Adrian also yes. teach at that? Yes, they did. Okay, very good. And we were talking about when your, when your dad discovered his illness, and yes. his illness was what again? Uh, multiple sclerosis. Okay, and that, that really wasn't as understood as much then as it is now. Unfortunately, they still don't have a cure for it. Right. But, but it, it's a very serious issue. We were talking about how your family had to make certain changes to adapt to the loss of income and so on and so forth. Yes. What is, okay, we've talked about that and how the family dealt with it, but let's talk about happier things. What was one of your happiest memories from going to high school there? I guess um, I love the classes. I yeah. love, yeah, I love. You had both boys and girls there, didn't you? No, no, just girls. All girls? Yes, all so girls. So what was the all boys school? Um, in, the, in the area? Well, we would do sock hops with uh, De La Salle and ah. Austin High School okay. and Notre Dame. So, um, yeah, we would do, you know, we would go to the football games and, you know, the sock hops and those kind of, and that's where we'd meet boys. But, you know, really during high school, my sister that's just younger than me, she's in the grade, she was in the grade be behind me. And we did everything together, and um, even dating. I mean, we would, it wouldn't be like dating. It would be more like going out in groups, sure. doing group things. Mm -hmm. um, I love Latin. I love taking Latin in high school because Latin is the core of all English. So when you know Latin words, you know the meanings of a lot of English words. And um, I took shorthand in typing because I knew that I would have to have a marketable skill um, to help support the family when I got I wanted to go to college, and I took academic classes so that I could go to college, but of course, financially, we weren't able to. Were your parents trying to steer you in any particular direction as far as a career goes? Wife and mother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Which that is was... documented by the book, by the way, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was... And, and the nuns at school, too. I mean, it was like assumed your career was going to be as a wife and mother. So that was pushed pretty hard. Subtly, but yeah. 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 Did you kind of test the water once in a while with them and say, you know, I wonder what it would be like to go to the University of Michigan or something like that? No, because there was no money. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was like more like a dream. I mean, I... My college I went to when I was in my 30s, I started at college. After I actually had published my first two books, mm -hmm. I went to college and continued. Um, well, I started at Macomb Community College, then I went to Oakley University, and then U of M night classes while I was working. Now, in the book, Sixth of Twelve, I believe one of the issues you address mm -hmm. is deviating from the norm as far as the traditional upbringing is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little more about that. What was going through your mind? Was it occupational? Was it religious? What were the things you were grappling with that didn't kind of fall into the traditional set of norms that, that you were li having, had to live with? Okay. Well, for, you know, first it was a health issue because I had thought I mean, I had our first three children in two and a half years. I mean, I, and then the next baby that we had, um, I had issues during the childbirth and almost died. And, um, and of course, he did pass away. And I was told that if I had any more children, the same thing would happen. So this was later on. 
the, yes, those so, issues were oh, grappled so, with. Right. So yeah, yeah. Right. Up until that time, I just assumed I was right. going to be away. And, and I want to cover that ground too. But let's go back to high school for a okay. moment. What was going through your mind about what you really wanted to do when you were in high school, especially as you approached your junior and senior year? Well, in my senior year, I actually met my husband. So did he go to De La Salle? Or? No, he went to Catholic Central, but we belonged to um, the Third Order of St. Francis, mm -hmm. where the Capuchin Monastery is. There was a group there for young adults, and uh, my sister and my brothers and sisters, my older ones, had gone there. And then my sister, that's just younger than I, uh, we started going down there. And I met my husband there, and he's actually a cradle rubber. <laughs> um, he's six years older than I am, and he oh, already really? yeah, and he already was out of the navy when I met him, and I was seventeen. What did your parents think of that? They liked him. Did they? Yeah, okay. they liked him. Yeah, they always liked him. I mean, he's and and for me, the thing that most attracted me to him was his intelligence. I just thought he was so smart. Do you and, still feel that way? Oh, absolutely. I'm just checking. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay. Were there any thoughts of college at all at that point, or was that pretty much? It, it, I, no. I mean, I, I, it, was, it was a dream. It was a dream. But it was just something that I thought I couldn't have. So, um, you know, when you're in that circumstance and you're, you know, in that family, it was mostly, you know, graduating, getting, making some money, helping out at home. Sure. So when graduation day finally arrived, what was your plan for the next step? Uh, I already had a job as a secretary in a law firm. Oh. Yeah. I, um, it was a one-girl office, and I, I look back on that because when I worked in that one-girl office, it was no computers. It was typewriters sure. and taking shorthand. And I can remember the lawyer standing like over my shoulder, a, a client waiting in the office dictating a will. And if you made one error, you had to retype the whole thing because you couldn't white out or anything. Um, and it kind of amazes me today that I could have done that. <laughs> Things we had to deal with back exactly, then. Exactly, huh? exactly. Um, but I don't, did I get off of answering your question? Or? Yes, you did. <laughs> well, you, you were dating your husband at that time, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so, so how long did you date before you finally got married? Um, when my husband, my dad said to my, uh, the guy I was going out with, what are your intentions with my daughter? And he said that he wanted to marry me. And my dad said, all right, she's young. Um, you have to at least be engaged a year um, to, if she agrees to get married. And so I got married when I was 19. Just out of curiosity, did your other siblings kind of uh, act as the court of law on him? Uh, on my dad? No, I'm oh, on, my your, husband? on your husband. Oh, oh, for sure. Oh, I'm sure they did too. <laughs> oh, for sure. You know, you're, in, you're from a large enough family to know how that works. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so did you keep working on that when you got married? Did you continue to work at the law office? or? Um, I worked at the law office until I got pregnant, but uh, we had our first son nine months and three weeks after we we're married. <laughs> okay, on that thought, we're going to take another break, but don't go away. We'll be right back with Colette. There's a lot of history to Oxford. Hidden around every corner, deep in every crack, and sometimes right in front of you, waiting to be discovered. If you just dig a little, you'll find the great history of our beautiful town. Welcome to Historic Oxford. Back with Colette Talby de Wasik. Very pleased to have you on our show, Colette. Thank you. Talking about uh, being raised as a good Catholic child here. Uh, we talked about uh, you getting married when you were 19. You were working in a law office at that time, and nine months after you got married, you had a, your first child. Yes, we did. Okay, tell me more about that. Was Did you have a boy or a girl? A boy. 
Now, by the way, what did your husband do for a living? I didn't ask you that before. Um, he was in the Navy. Let's see, he was some kind of engineer. I can't think of what it is. Was he in the Navy at that time? No, he had just gotten out of the oh, Navy when okay. we met. Um, and then he worked for what well, was Frieden, um, Frieden Adding Machine Company. Mm -hmm. um, and he was you know, repairing machines and setting up machines and all. And um, so he did that for a lot of years. And then um, he got into management and then he got into sales and he actually went to night school he's the one that went before me mm -hmm. to night school to get his degree okay um what came after law school for you well you had a baby did you continue to work or no 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 not in those days i um no i had the baby then 17 months later i had another baby and then less than a year later i had another baby <laughs> so i was pretty occupied. With. Yeah, but not, not all of those were happy experiences, right? The, the, oh yeah, they were. The, the first three the were? The first three, yeah. It was the fourth that, um, where I had the problem. Okay, what was the situation there? How old were you then? 27, I think. Let's see, that would be 1967, and I was born in 41, so 26 I was. Wow. Yeah, um, and I, well, I started hemorrhaging while I was Okay. In labor. And was that when you started rethinking the Catholic tradition of yes. having so many children? Oh, yes. Well, because um, the doctor said if I had more, the same thing would happen. Well, what do you do? I had three children in two and a half years. Obviously, the church approved way didn't work. So, um, and then by then, birth control pills had been introduced. So, um, I. I don't know if because it's not a totally Catholic audience, but I don't know. I went to confession to talk to the priest to say I have to take these birth control pills because, um, you know, I can't have any sure. more children. And so the priest said, you can take them, but only for half a month. And I, you can't take them, you can, practicing rhythm with them, if you take them half a month then you can take them. Well, I couldn't do that because it gave me migraines. So I said, well, that didn't make sense. If you can take them for that length of time, why can't you take them you know, all the time? And he said, um, well, my conscience tells me that you can't. If you disagree, you can go talk to the priest on the other side of the church. And Get a second opinion, is yeah, that what he said? Yeah, and I said, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense to me. I have my own conscience, and I can follow that. And then when I got out of the confessional, my husband was there with me, and he, he hurried me out of church because I had gotten really loud, and everybody yeah. in church could hear me. Yeah, this, so uh, that, you know, the, the, the intent of our show, obviously, is not to condemn Catholic traditions mm -hmm. in any s stretch of the imagination, but, but a lot of Catholics and a lot of other people have had to dealt with issues, deal with issues like this. That's right. And so I think that should be more the focus of how you deal with it. Did you have, did you, at that time, did you sit down with your mother and go through some of this stuff to see what her point of view was? No, my mother, you never, I never could talk to my mother about stuff like that, ever. No. Um, she did hear the that I made a scene at the confessional and she called me up to ask me <laughs> what that was about. Really? Yeah. But um, it was, you know, I, I, I never could talk to my mom about stuff like what that. What about your brothers and sisters? Um, where at that point, they were all grown up, right? Or they were older. Were, um, were you able to talk to any of them about that or did you? No, just my husband. You kind of came to the conclusion that it was up to you to make the decision. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. And But then, you know, Actually, I questioned stuff from the time I was really young. Um, when I was in grade school, I would question things. Um, and uh, so I think probably all of my life I've kind of relied on my gut and my conscience in making decisions. And I think that was part of what was taught by my parents, um, that you're just as smart as anybody else. and you know, you can take care of yourself. Absolutely. Tell me about the experience with your last child. You lost the child, is that right? Yes, Jeff, he was 20. 
he was... Oh, uh, okay, so you didn't lose him as a baby. No, he, no. Okay. No, no. no, he had a cerebral hemorrhage. He was at University of Michigan. Um, he was a junior, and he had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed away. Sorry to hear that. When did you start thinking more seriously about going to college? Well, first, you know, well, we adopted our youngest daughter, I, and I didn't talk about that yet, but we adopted our youngest daughter in 1969. What led to that decision? Having lost the baby, we, we still wanted another child, and um, um, one of our neighbors had a, adoption laws had just changed then, where people with biological children could adopt. It was pre-abortion, and there were more babies available than parents. So you them. lost your first child, is that correct? No, no, our, th our fourth child, and then Jeff, when he was 20 years old, he okay, was Okay, that second was the child. second child you lost. Okay, yeah. it's clear in my mind. Sorry about that. That's okay. okay. Um, what, what was the, the loss of the baby? What was the situation there? That was when I hemorrhaged, and okay. he had to be born by C-section. He was uh, two months, I mean, two weeks premature, and in those days, they they couldn't save him. He was six pounds, 12 ounces. He was not like today, yeah. where they're able to save babies that are real tiny. Okay. But uh, he had what they call hyaline membrane disease, which is a coating in the lungs, and he, they said that if he lived... Um, two and a half days, he would be fine. It would clear up and he would be fine. But he didn't survive. Didn't have the chance. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt your story about thinking about college, but oh. please go ahead. Oh, all right. So let's see. So after we adopted Jeanette, and, you know, then she was getting, you know, older, and I, what am I going to do now? I mean, I had a lot of energy. Um, so I decided I wanted to write. And, um, there was a, a mail order class that you could take. It was called Famous Writer School. And um, I think it was like $400 it cost. And so I decided in order to, Jerry, my husband would have, he said, oh, you know, I'll pay for it. And I said, no, no, I want to do it myself. So I sold makeup. I did makeup demonstrations to get enough money to pay for the course. And it was 10 lessons and the Tenth lesson was to write the first chapter and outline for a book, and that's how I sold it to Harper and Row. And then after I published my books, um, I started thinking. Oh, and Jerry had gone to college. He was had, this the book on adoption you were yes, talking about? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, Jerry had gone to college. He had gone to night school on the VA um, plan. And I thought, you know, I, I just want to see if I can do it. And um, so then I signed up and. Um, went to college and you know that's how I decided I could do it I okay, could do it very good need to take another break but sure. we'll be right back with Colette don't go away a small town with a lot of heart and history hidden gem with a sense of community. Welcome to Leonard. We were talking about uh, your initial experience with college. Yes. So you got your bachelor's degree from where? Oakland University. Oakland University. Yeah. I got my associates from um, Macomb Community College, then my bachelor's from Oakland, and then my master's from um, U, U of M. U of M. Mm -hmm. At what point did you end up going back to work? Um, after I published my second book in 1974, okay. I had finished, um, I had finished I had just a couple more classes to finish at Macomb, and I found a company. Um, well, Campbell Ewald had their publishing division in Warren at the time, and we were living in Warren at the time. And they published magazines for like Chevrolet, GM, um, oh, God, all different kinds of companies, sure. corporate publications. So I had, you know, I went there and applied. And it was, 
in 74, which was during a recession, the only job they had open was as a secretary. And, but the man that interviewed me wanted to hire me as a writer, but they didn't have an opening. So he said, if you start as a secretary, as soon as there's an opening as a writer, I'll put you in there. And it was only six weeks later then that I was able to start writing at the company. And I did a lot of, and the articles weren't like company related. They were like, I interviewed Janet Guthrie, who was the first ra woman race car driver. Or, uh, I wrote an article about growing tomatoes and are they a vegetable or a fruit. Um, I did travel articles. I mean, it was... A, it was probably, it was very interesting. Sir. Very interesting, yeah. Um, but, and while I was there, they were willing to pay for college. So then I decided to go to night school while I was working there to get my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to ask you, you were talking about uh, writing these books on adoption. Mm -hmm. What was the inspiration for you to write a book on that subject? I mean, I know you adopted one of your Jeanette, kids. Yeah. What was there about that experience that caused you to put it in writing? Well, at the up till that time, adoption was just for people who were unable physically to have children. And the laws had changed so that families with other, with their biological children or able to have more children were able to adopt. So the adoption laws had changed. And um, there were no books about that. So that's what put me on that subject. And it's the self-examination of things that you think about, like, you know, when you're considering adoption. Sure. Can you have, raise a uh, adopted child the same as a biological ch uh, child? Mm -hmm. All the things that you would question yourself on and how to do it. Did you talk to your child about the fact that he was adopted? Oh, yeah. Um, always. I mean, that was one of the things that was important in talking to, doing my research, that a child is always known right from the beginning that they're adopted. And you say, oh, you're my special adopted baby or, you know, so that they grow up with the whole knowledge that they've been adopted. Eventually, did he ever want to try and, and seek out his parents? No, it's a girl. and She? Yeah. And uh, no, she never, well, all right. When she was 16, when she was going through a little bit of a rebellious age, she wanted to. And I said, I have absolutely no problem with you looking up your biological mother, but you have to wait till you're 18. And then after that, she never wanted to. And she still doesn't today. Mm -hmm. So you got your master's degree. Mm -hmm. What encouraged you to go on to get your master's degree? Well, I was in the business world and I was moving up quite rapidly and I thought that a master's degree would be helpful. I had done for General Motors a series of um, recruitment brochures for college. They were recruiting college students at the time and I realized how important and how valuable a master's degree would be and I thought if I was going to get it I might as well get it from some place worthwhile. So. Now at what point did you start thinking about getting into politics? Um, well, my, uh, uh, my lifelong friend um, was elected to Macomb County um, clerk in, well, it was 24 years ago now. And I was working at the company I was working at, which was Vickers. Um, I was in charge of communications, marketing communications there. And they had decided they were moving the headquarters to Toledo. And I didn't want to move. And coincidentally, she called me and said, oh, I've got this mess here, I need help. She says, you know, won't you? And she didn't even know that I had been going to be transferred. It was totally coincidental. Um, she says, you know, I'd like you to come and work with me, be my deputy. And, and I, you know, I didn't know how that would be because she was, you know, a lifelong friend, how it would be working with somebody that closely. And I said, oh, Carmela, I don't know. And she said, look, if you come six weeks or six months or six years, she says, just come and help me out. So 
I went there and I had the management experience and um, so I worked there for three and a half years and but then it got to be a long drive from Lake Orion and at, at the same time people from Orion I was on the library board and they were looking for somebody to run for supervisor and talked me into running so it was a combination of the drive and people wanting me to run mm -hmm. that I never really had a desire to get into politics. It just kind of mm -hmm. happened. <laughs> what of your Catholic traditions did you feel important to pass on to your kids? Catholic traditions. To me, it's more like a spirituality than a Catholic tradition. I mean, I'm, my husband and I are very active in our church. I mean, we're at St. Joe's and we lived in Orion and we are now. But to me, it's the ethics, it's the integrity, it's the spiritual, spirituality that is most important. Um, so, I don't know, I'd have to give that more thought as Did far as Did that help tradition. you when your, your son lost his life at age 20? Oh, absolutely. The thing about the core belief that I was raised in is that things happen for a reason and God has his, God has his way and you accept it. I didn't feel, I didn't feel like mad at God or anything. I just felt like my son had accomplished what he came to earth for. And it's kind of like in hindsight, I think about our baby dying. Or I, if our baby hadn't died, I wouldn't have adopted our daughter. I wouldn't have written the book on adoption. And that is almost like a path that you can see in hindsight. Okay, you've told me that you feel like your mother inspired you to write the book. Mm -hmm. If she was to be sitting next to us today listening to our conversation uh -huh. what would she say i'm proud of you yeah she would have said that and that would have meant so much to hear that i always like to ask my guests at the very end of our our interview if you could live your life over again would there be anything that you would change you know, I've thought about that, and I don't think so. I think that, you know, I've just been very fortunate and lucky in love. Well, we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much for that. Oh. I've enjoyed talking to you. Oh, thank you, and thank you for having me. Colette Tauby DeWasick, thanks for joining us. Welcome to American Legion in Oxford for the best fish on Fridays. That's right, from noon to 8.30, you can get the best walleye in Michigan. You can get walleye, baked cod, chicken strips, baked potatoes, and more. On the hall side of the Legion, oh, hello there, friends. You can have 12 friends on a table, any one of the best military museums in Michigan. And the dining side, oh, hello again. More comfortable with many four-seat tables and a couple of five-seaters. Now, on Friday, we have usually have about four to 500 of best friends for our fish. Carry out. You bet. We have 50 to 60 carryouts at the post. We have some young friends with the birthdays and some of our best seniors at the post. Oh so yeah, waitresses, they go like a track waitress to get your food. If you have never enjoyed our secret famous walleye at the Legion, come on in every Friday from noon to 8.30 at the American Legion Post, 108 on 130 East Rainer Road, Oxford. Canine Stray Rescue is Oxford's own local dog rescue. Call them at 248-628-0435 or go to their website, dogsaver.org, and click on the Canine Stray Rescue League link.